platform is completely free for investors. Now, what is the how uh, Seven and a half percent. No carry. No carry. Um, so uh, an option that is available for companies on our platform is um, in order to keep minimum investment sizes down, uh, we can help them form single purpose LLCs to pool crowdfunded investments and then make you know, one large investment into a company. Uh, even in that scenario, those single purpose LLCs from the perspective of the investor are management fee free as well as carry free investment vehicles, meaning that the economic return of investment in that vehicle as opposed to the company itself are pretty much identical. Um, so, equity crowdfunding, um, it, it's, it's growing, um, still very young. Um, the, uh, I'd say proxy, if, we, if you may, um, that we use to kind of gauge the direction of where we're going um, is actually peer-to-peer -peer lending. Just because of the security laws that we were essentially waiting to get past, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending has just been around for longer than we have. Um, and <coughs> Much as the peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms have seen an increase in um, institutions essentially coming in, um, implementing electronic buying programs to interact with the APIs of their platform and essentially creating electronic trading in, for lack of a better word, in, in those markets, we have similarly seen an increase um, in the number of individuals signing up on our platform, not nearly as individual angel investors, but as um, employees of venture capital firms as well as family offices and members of angel groups that are utilizing our platform to facilitate their own deal flow. Um, that, you know, the $550,000 check that came through our platform obviously came from a family office, like I stated, um, and that $30,000 um, uh, average check size has actually pretty much doubled over the last, I'd say, six to nine months. And that's been uh, just basically uh, in conjunction with the um, you know, kind of more upstream investors coming online. So uh, trying to compare this slide with one previous is a little bit of an apples to orange comparison, um, but it does give a pretty good um, kind of perspective on the opportunities that do exist. Um, and this is basically kind of evaluating the market potential uh, based on, uh, or through the, the lens of Reg D offerings. Um, and it really just does show there's a lot of upside. This uh, is a little bit biased towards our focus. We are a technology, uh, a technology uh, kind of centric platform, um, but it you know really can show that uh, <coughs> kind of, again, extrapolating from merely looking at tech companies in their seed Series A rounds to um, companies in all industries in all rounds um, grows the market size uh, uh, quite significantly. Um, and when you throw in private equity firms and venture capital firms, which can utilize uh, pretty much the same regulations and technologies to facilitate their own fundraisers and attracting new LPs to their rounds, that increases the market by almost a couple orders of magnitude in and of itself. Um, so, uh, why is uh, equity crowdfunding and crowdfunding in general growing so quickly, and why do we believe it will continue to do so? Uh, the answer to the first question is that crowdfunding in its various forms addresses two of the biggest problems uh, that uh, entrepreneurs uh, face. Uh, the first is that there is an amazingly asymmetric relationship between uh, the entrepreneur who is seeking funding and the investor who is quite literally holding the purse strings. Um, the second is that there is always a bit of a chicken and the egg problem uh, when it comes to fundraising. Uh, the uh, Virtuix fundraise actually is a, is a pretty good example of how crowdfunding can solve this problem. Um, uh, Virtuix, when they uh, first approached us, uh, had about $1.2 million in commitments for their $2 million round, but only about 300000 of that was in the bank. Uh, they were engaged in discussions with a number of family offices, VCs, and angels who were all sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Their raise launched on our platform. We were able to help uh, get uh, $550,000 of investments in the first two weeks. The company was able to go back to the investors, say not only have they gathered those investments, but there are another 40 investors on Seed Invest who are looking to invest an aggregate $4 million in their $2 million round. At this point, it's not a matter of, you know, are those investors interested in investing? It's you need to make a decision because you're going to miss out. Um, so uh, it also kind of tangentially speaks to uh, one of the most kind of significant repercussions of crowdfunding as well, in that it has uh, essentially fundamentally changed business formation in the country. Uh, entrepreneurs no longer have to go out seeking a major round of funding, build a business, and then validate consumer demand. Uh, now they can simply come out with a minimum viable product or service, raise capital, um, and then validate that demand before they build uh, their company. Uh, 
there is also a feeder nature, if you will, to the crowdfunding space, uh, where you have you know, enterprising individuals who are able to raise through donation-based crowdfunding sites, uh, then are able to parlay that into a true seed round, utilizing general solicitation. Um, and we see uh, venture capital firms as kind of picking off the uh, kind of higher quality uh, deals that come from the equity crowdfunding space, especially now that a number of those firms are essentially trying to write too big of check sizes for the earliest of companies to be able to absorb. Um, so, uh, Title III is, is obviously what we're all waiting for. Um, Title III will significantly increase the number of potential investors in this market, uh, opening up about a quarter billion uh, Americans who have up until this point been uh, regulatorily barred uh, from investing in, um, in these types of opportunities. Um, and it, we really can't overstate um, yeah, how, how uh, dis potentially disruptive uh, this is going to be. I apologize if this quote has already been used at, at another presentation today. It, it is often used at this point. Uh, but Fred Wilson had a uh, pretty significant observation that with $30 trillion sitting in US bank accounts, or savings accounts currently, even if there is a simple 1% shift to startups and small businesses as a result of Title III, uh, you're already looking at a $300 billion market. By the way, it's more like $40 trillion. Even better. Mm -hmm. So what's the <laughs> um, So the one kind of last thing I wanted to uh, mention before wrapping this up um, is, uh, and it again kind of speaks to uh, the inclusive nature of our platform wanting to work alongside and with established groups. Uh, what you're looking at here are uh, landing pages for three angel groups uh, that utilize our platform, our technology to uh, facilitate deal flow and investments um, for their groups. Um, and uh, kind of taking that a step further, um, it was announced actually about two hours ago or a little bit more at this point, uh, that 500 Startups is going to be uh, partnering with Seedinvest uh, to publicly raise their third flagship fund. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of 500 Startups, they are the most, uh, one of the most active uh, VC investors in the world, one of the largest um, active accelerator programs. They have 750 portfolio companies, 200 mentors, and about a thousand entrepreneurs. Um, and in our opinion, this is you know kind of a an example of how equity crowdfunding is going to be moving more upstream, um, and it's something that's going to be increasingly common uh, going forward. Um, Fundamental change in the last 20 years, you can see that in the 90s you had over 4,000 uh, companies putting in IPOs, and in the, in the 2000s, it's less than half. Meanwhile, the total gross proceeds have barely, have barely gotten bigger, but the average I, I, IPO size has almost tripled. So that just means that larger companies, the only ones doing IPOs, and the smaller companies are just not doing it anymore. And that, that's part of the in the market. But you, something also to know here is, the median time to IPO and the amount raised prior to capital. You have an average now of s almost seven years before they get to an IPO stage and almost 100 million before they ever hit the IPO stage. That's your average. It's, and there's reasons for that. There's, there's, there's a couple theories for it. Again, it's been touched on before that it's caused by uh, governmental overregulation. Sorry, exactly, you know, the, 
increased cost of having audited reports, having internal control reports, that's making it so that smaller businesses, it's less likely for them to be able to get to the IPO stage. Uh, it's just too, too cost prohibitive for them. Uh, this has also been touched on before. Um, well, they've touched on it a little bit. Some say that the Rule 301, they increased the tick size, uh, made it so that it was less profitable for brokers, uh, basically causing trades to be automated, and uh, killing the interest in the secondary market for these smaller IPOs, which just led to you know it, it being a less viable option for smaller companies. And then litigation. I'm a lawyer. You go to court. If you go public, you're going to go to court at some point. You need to. Whether you did something wrong or not, somebody's going to take you to court, and you're going to have to fight it, you have to waste time, you have to waste money. The time you should be spending to your business. So you try to stay out of the public spotlight, you small business, because they don't have the time or the money to do it. So again, more of the reasons why uh, the middle market IPO is, is just basically going away with the dinosaur. The other, it, the other theory is that it shifts the market. Market themselves. The, the investors just don't think that these smaller companies belong in the IPO market. And the reason why is because a lot of these smaller companies, uh, the growth-wise, half of it, you have about 66% of deal list after three years, the smaller companies, so they just fail. They just, not that they fail, but then they come out of the public market because they're not doing well. And even the ones that don't deal list after 10 years, they're showing probably a 30% growth after 10 years, which is not a good growth for, for 10 years in small companies. So, ten, so small, com small IPOs, tend to stay small even after 10 years. And then the market shift toward indirect ownership. It used to be that, uh, you know, with the dot-com bubble, there was the E-Trade, the, the people wanted to get involved, they wanted to do their own trades, and then when it, when it fell down, they start trusting uh, people again. They start trusting brokers again, doing it through mutual funds, they don't, don't really want to have a uh, direct control of it. So as a result, you have the mutual funds that are driving the IPO market, and they're the one, and in order to keep their commissions, they have to invest in larger companies. So again, the capital and the, the potential in the IPO market for middle market companies, try them. Just not that. So, we get to the good part, the alternatives, what we're here to discuss. What alternatives do these middle market companies have? Slow death of middle market companies, always venture capital. There's always venture capital out there, but uh, one of the things that you need to know about venture capital is uh, and I'll discuss this later. It, it, the, the bigger VCs are going toward the uh, the larger companies. So for the middle market, you still have to get through one, two, three rounds before you can even get to the VCs. In a lot of cases, I know that some of the smaller ones. We'll discuss this again. Uh, have the potential to do the growth round strategies, but it's not uh, getting directly to these bigger VCs is not as easy as it used. Private placements, angel investors, and crowdfunding are title two crowdfunding. Uh, just your regular angel investors is going to be one of the biggest ones as I'll discuss. And then merchant acquisitions. And I'll, and I'll explain why this is effective because it goes back into the market strategy. So getting to the venture capital, as I said. Uh, you see, venture capital basically, they, they like to invest in companies they can bring to market fast, get a good exit strategy. So in order to do that in today's market, they have to do it with larger companies. As you can see from here, the majority of the money is being done in later stage rounds and with companies that are profitable. I mean, this is not, a lot of your middle market companies, you know, obviously they are all early stage, but a lot of middle market companies are early stage, less profitable, so they're getting a lot less of the VC capital these days. Uh, and over the past couple years, you've seen micro VCs come out. You've seen people with smaller funds. These are doing in the, in the, in the smaller growth ranges. Uh, and what's interesting to note is this is a very good kind of bridging that funding gap between the, the traditional VCs that used to be there. You have since the first quarter of um, 2011, you have about 627 million involved, and the average capital raise is about three and a half million. So this covers your, your nice little round that they have to get to uh, to get to the next step. And again, you're, when, you're, when you're looking in terms of the whole IPO market and, and, and the middle market companies, they're gonna have to do one, two, three rounds. So a $3 million round, a $10 million round, this is gonna help get them to the next level. This is what companies are doing now. Uh, to, to move forward, rather than trying to do the 50 million, 100 million IPO. The private place, this is, this is where all the money's at right now. And uh, one thing really to interesting to notice, and this is a 2012 chart, the table on the right here, uh, and this is from the SEC. If you look at 2012, they had 903 billion uh, in 2012, of total amount of regulation D operates. 
from CrowdNetic, who's one of the few that's actually um, looking at the market analysis of title uh, of uh, uh, 50063 offerings. They estimate that uh, since the inception uh, of the Jobs Act, since the effectiveness of the Jobs Act, they've had 15 million in offerings just from the, the, um, the 50063 and 150 million raised just in since the last year. So it, it's a big chunk of the market. So this is where a lot of the middle market companies are going, 506 offering. And you can see it here, it's almost the same chart if you look. If as the companies are have to get bigger to get IPOs, the increase in private placements. So again, it's just this is where middle market companies are going. This is where I think the future is uh, in terms of uh, of funding that gap. It's not going to be, they're not looking to do the IPOs anymore, they're going to private places to alternatives. And this is, this is your current uh, landscape of funds. Again, you get your angel investors, your crowdfunding uh, 506C3, like I said. This is where you're going to get your, your larger rounds of funding, your 5, 10, 20 million dollars, where they need to get to the next level. Potential future sources. You have, and, and we haven't touched a lot on interstate crowdfunding, and there's, you know, obviously it's on the smaller end of the spectrum, but again, when you're dealing with um, earlier stage companies that $2 million, which some, some states have a $2 million cap, uh, that can mean the difference between one round and the next. It can difference between uh, life or death for these companies. So I mean, it is a potential source. You're gonna see a combination of sources for middle market companies. You're gonna see them going to uh, Kickstarter to vet their, their products first. You're going to see them go into the interesting and the smaller rounds, possibly in Title III when it's when it's enacted. That will get you the first small rounds, moving up to these final six C3 sometimes. You're gonna see them grow, basically, so that they can not only vet their product, but vet their market. Now, obviously, there's issues with that. The final SEC regulations could put a damper on, on how all of this is done, especially when you, when you deal with Title III. We don't know what, what it's gonna be entailed, and as we said here, you know, a lot of these rules might make it not viable for Title III crowdfunding to, to, um, to be even be used by small businesses in an effective manner. And the other is the looming July deadline, the credit investor definition. I know that uh, our, my colleague here doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't think that there's a lot that's going to change with that. I tend to hear a little bit, I, I've done a little bit of research on it, and I tend to think that there might be some substantial movement in the definition.